Okay, so, so how do we do all this? We do it through working members, like these two lovely women who are stocking the dairy case, or the yogurt case. Um, we know that members, there's two things people who join co-ops give you, right? Well, there's one thing, basically. One thing is equity. You, if you own a business, you should contribute some capital to it. You're an owner, you should give something. The other thing we ask for is time. And that's probably the more precious of those two things. And so we know that by asking time, people are making a deeper commitment because we all only have some limited time here on the earth. But we think that if you own a business, you should be contributing it in your labor and in your equity. Um, so we, that's basically the two things we ask of people. Um, and probably we give, we prob the time part of it is the part we concentrate on more than the equity part. Um, I wanted to also say that, um, like I said at the beginning, we talk about members, member owners, we never say they're volunteers. You're not volunteering in the business you own. If you own the shop somewhere, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm gonna go volunteer today. No, you're gonna go work. And it's like, like the woman said to Bill, oh, I have to go work my shift. Not volunteer at my shift, I have to go work my shift. So it's establishing that culture of ownership that people belong to something and they say, oh, you know, it's my turn in this month, it's my turn to show up at work and do work. Um, some people, I guess, never get that about the co-op and always say, well, I don't wanna work for food. And um, we say, well, that's fine. There's lots of other outlets for you, but if you wanna work for food, please join us. So if you don't, if someone doesn't wanna do it, there's a lot of other options. Um, I'm not really worried about those folks, but I do want the people who come to work to feel valued and respected. And that's where a lot of my, our, our thinking goes, is make work valuable to them. And how we do that is run the most efficient business we can to give them the best price. There are no classes of membership at the Park Slope Crew Co-op. Um, all members are required to work. This is actually a picture of our office, um, the membership office. Um, like I said, all those are members. It's um, Bill probably has experienced this. It's a little, um, you know, people don't always get answering the phone, right? But um, they might hang up on you, they might. Um, but it's, it's sort of kind of one of the hubs of the co-op because people, you know, come in here and they're greeted by other members and they're trying to figure out their problems with their membership or they want to do some other kind of work or they need to change their schedule or whatever it is. Um, but it's a great, equalizer when there's no classes of membership. Um, it goes back to the equity and equality, no matter where you come from in life. Um, I don't, you could be an extremely wealthy person in Park Slope, and you could be someone who's on some sort of income assistance, but you both have to work. No one gets to buy themselves out of it. Um, there's no division saying, well, that's the group of people who had a little more money, so they gave the co-op a little more money and then they don't do that work thing. And then here's all the rest of us who don't have that money um, or can't afford it or whatever, out of work. Um, and so when you go in, and I maybe Bill can attest to this, when you go in, um, what you're struck by in the co-op is just the basic equalizing effect that everyone's doing something in there for their own co-op. Um, you don't have anyone waiting on someone else. You know, it's not like there's some people shopping who haven't ever stocked a shelf and then there's the poor people that have to stock the shelf, you know. Um, I think that it's a tremendous, um, it's, it's, it, when I was preparing for this, Joe and I were talking and we were talking about, it's a tremendous almost spiritual experience in a very, un-American way. <laughs> um, 
There is not, I mean, I, I just, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but that it has some sort of spiritual quality that you're walking into a place in which, um, despite what people might do on the outside, on the other side of those doors, or where they come from, or what nation they were born in, or what's their native language, or what religious practices they have, whatever it is, um, everyone's in there doing the same thing. And for a lot of times, you have no idea that, you know, you're stocked in the shelves next to someone, you're sitting in the office next to someone. You talk about the co-op, you talk about life, you talk about everything. Sometimes you have no idea what that person actually does for a living. And sometimes it's shocking, you know. Um, uh, you know, I know there are people who manage head fund, hedge funds that work at the co-op. I also know there's famous filmmakers and authors and um, people that, well, uh, the department, the secretary of housing, um, Donovan, uh, the Sean Donovan, was actually a member of the co-op. He called up and he said, <laughs> when Obama appointed him, he loved the co-op, and he called up and he said, oh, I got a problem. And the person answering the phone said, well, what's the problem? And he said, well, he said, I have to go work in Washington, and I can't make my shift. And the person said, oh, well, okay, um, well, you could take a leave of absence, you could quit, the, he goes, quit the co-op? No, that's not, you know, my wife and my children will still be here, I just gotta work this out. And it turns out that you're talking to the, <laughs> to the new secretary of housing, <laughs> he's trying to work out how to stay a member of the co-op. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of equalizer. It was meaningful in his life, and he gets appointed by the president, and then I, you know, but he calls the co-op and says, well, how can I work this out, you know? <laughs> because I don't want to necessarily, I don't want to leave the co-op. Um, so I, I always, I think of things like that. I also think about, I was, the other night I was sitting in my office, which, you know, we have open kind of offices, and there was Larry, and Larry's been, a, sits in the office with me every eight weeks. He's there doing this job that he does once every eight weeks. And we kind of talk, and, and I told Larry I was going, and he was so thrilled. Um, and I, he said something like, um, well, let me, he said, let me tell you, he said, I, I wasn't an enthusiastic member of the co-op because I didn't want to be a member. And he said, but then I met my wife 25 years ago, and she said, well, if you want to be married, you'll have to join the co-op, you know. <laughs> and he said, so, you know, I said, okay, I'll do the co-op. And he goes, and I said, well, well, how'd that work out? Like, well, how soon did you always not like it? And he goes, oh my God. He said, once I was here and I started working, he goes, I was like, well, this is what she's been talking about all these years that we've been dating. And I said, well, and he said, but you know, I belong to another co-op and I, and that co-op will now remain unnamed, but it's in Brooklyn. And he said, um, I, it's my late night shopping. When the co-op's closed, I have to pop out for some milk. I'll go across to this other co-op. And he said, but you know, he goes, I feel like a customer there. I don't feel like a member. And he goes, I'm a member, but I feel like a customer. And I thought that was really meaningful. He actually, like, to me, it was like, wow, you know, this is a guy who actually didn't want to join the co-op, did for love, said, became an enthusiastic member, is a member of another co-op for convenience sake, and in he no, recognizes the difference between when he walks into the co-op and when he works in someplace else. Um, the other thing about no classes of membership is um, we, we want people to decide to become a member outside the building. So before you join the co-op, we want you to decide that you're going to join or not join. We don't want you to decide what kind of membership you're going to have when you're in the building. And by that I mean when you're standing at the shelf, right, and there's a can of beans, and, um, you know, there's the price, and then there's the member price. And you sit there and you go, wow, okay, so if I buy that can of beans and I'm a member, it's 40 cents less than if I'm a non-member, and if I translate that out to how much I get paid per an hour, what kind of savings is that? Oh no, that doesn't work for me. I won't become a member because I value myself more than that difference in price. We don't want anyone to ever think that. You make that decision outside. 
And when you come in, now you're just a member. Yeah. You know, you've made that decision for yourself and your family outside the building, and you come in and you don't think about the price on the shelf is the price for everyone. There's nothing going on in your head trying to value your time versus what the co-op's giving you in the discount off that can of beans because you're a member or whatever. All those calculations are ways of not connecting people to the co-op. They're a way of thinking of a co-op as some entity separate from yourself in which you're kind of negotiating a deal with. And we, and we, just, we just think that's unnecessary. That creates divisions that don't need to be there. Um, so what do people do and how do they do it? Um, this is kind of the, the, this is how we do it. This is how you have to come up with sort of a schedule, a rota, whatever you want to call it, some way of organizing this because in effect, it's like a huge human resources department, right? You have all these employees <laughs> coming to work. Well, how, how much are they gonna work? Where are they gonna work? What kind of work are they gonna do? How often are they gonna do that work? All these things were developed over time in probably the first five years of the call, the, the basic structure of this was formed. But, you know, it, it's constant, it, it's, it's basically like having a, an organization of 16,000 employees. So we have to make it comprehensible and understandable. So you, we have, you have to spend some time thinking about the actual organization. And what happens is most people work once every four weeks. Not once a month, but once every four weeks. You just divide the year up, and it turns out to be 13 times a year. Um, it's pretty easy for people to remember that. Um, and they do the same work with the same group of people on the same day at the same time. So you want to build consistency, not only for the member, because the member needs to remember when they go to work, but you also want to build that regularity and the consistency because that's the way you build groups of people that have knowledge and share responsibility and leaders emerge from that group and they become self-managing and you don't have to have a paid staff person there overlooking them because the same group of people is coming together 13 times a year to do whatever kind of work you need them to do. Be that stocking, be that shop, you know, on the shopping committee checking people out, be that working in the office, be that doing inventory, maintenance, whatever it is. Most of those groups are very self-managed. Um, <clears throat> The consistency has created a community of people that feel responsible to each other, and then often one or two people will emerge as the leaders of those groups, which helps the group to have an identifiable person to whom they report inside the co-op, and it's not a staff person. Um, so I think that is the strength of the member labor system for us is this very understandable system. Um, we have to teach it over and over again to new people, but once someone gets it, they, they basically get it. Um, but, and they come upstairs and they say, oh, I can't work Wednesday anymore, but I wanna still do this kind of job shopping, I just want a different time of week. And another member can say, okay, fine, I'll help you find, and they go to where we have all the openings and they look for it. So, in that way, we're creating a system in which we as paid staff people, you want to reduce the amount of time that a paid staff person has to manage that relationship or that time. Um, so that's, that's the squad system. Um, and then this is the kind of work, <coughs> this is just examples of the kind of work that people can do. Um, the members do about in, in operating the store, they do about 75% of the work, um, but in some areas, they do 100% of the work. Um, so like in maintenance, we don't um, have any staff people that really are devoted to doing maintenance, or people who work on the shopping committee, checking people out or taking money from people, um, no staff people are involved in that. And, I mean, we might jump on a register if, if there's a long line or if there's a problem, but in general, a shopping committee can have 30 people on it and they basically come in and they get to work and they do it and we're there to support for technical problems or other kind of problems, but they do it without our intervention, you know. 
we, our time is more spent in the case of like a shopping committee training people, but the work itself gets done by them. Um, in that way, we maximize their labor because um, they're taking <coughs> responsibility in a regular group for doing it over and over again. I think the other thing that, um, we'll, now that we've gotten to the size that we are, um, these groups within, these work committees within the co-op are ways, are smaller communities for people to identify with. So they, you know, 16,000 people is a lot of people, and there's no way you're gonna know all those people, but if you knew, like in food processing, about 10 people work at any one time in that area, well, you know, that's like your own little community. You come in, you see the same other nine people that you saw four weeks ago. Something, and you share, you know, you share in the work, share in your life, too. Some people have been on the same committee for years, decades, in, in fact, you know. So it's, it's a tremendous community building type of, to organize the labor, it is, it builds a lot of community. Um, we do have, if you can't work, we have work exempt committees, these are them. Um, for some period of time, new parent, it's only a year you're off work after the, you, you can be off your work assignment. Um, people can be disabled both permanently or temporary, like they're just temporarily, they've had surgery, they've had broke their leg or whatever, they can't work. Um, bereavement, um, and then we have a retirement policy that was voted in by the members. Um, and then, so that would be people who are a certain age and have a certain length of membership in the co-op. So we don't, if you can't work, it's not a barrier to being a member of the co-op. There are ways in which the co-op has accommodated people who couldn't do their work assignment. Oh, before, the, the one thing I want to, um, long time ago at a co-op conference, one of the staff was asked, well, isn't member labor exclusionary? Like if someone doesn't want to do it, then you're excluding them. And the response, I think it was Joe or Mike said, well, um, aren't high prices exclusionary? So you pick your exclusion and I'll pick mine. <laughs> I don't think it went over too well with that other person. But, uh, you know, it, it's not exclusionary. One, because there are exemptions, but two, like again, if the decisions made outside of the building. We're not telling some, they don't join, and then we say five weeks later, oh, by the way, you gotta work. I mean, we, it's very clear from the get-go that you're required to work. So people join or they don't join. Um, so we don't consider that exclusionary. Um, but, I mean, some 